the greater the damage it could do to the installation. The mill is so expertly designed, the men so skilled, that within a few minutes of a cobble arising, the mill is back to normal. If you have to produce bars like these, primary rolling of the original ingot is essential. But in the making of sheet steel, there's a new method which eliminates the initial making of the ingot and primary rolling. The process is called continuous casting. Molten metal is poured into an open mold from which the slab issues. This machine can cast up to 14,000 tons of liquid steel a week. The steel is poured into the top of the long water-cooled mold, which is curved to help save space in the works. From the open bottom of the mold emerges a solid hot ribbon of metal, which can be cut into suitable sized slabs for rolling. They can be up to six feet wide and from six inches to 12 inches thick. The slabs are allowed to cool and then stored in a stockyard until they're needed. When they're acquired, they're heated to 1300 degrees centigrade, ready for rolling. The rolling is done in the hot strip mill over half a mile in length. The slabs are passed, first of all, through two sets of descaling rolls which remove most of the surface scale. Next, they go to a four-high single-stand reversing roughing mill. It's called four-high because for each of the water-cooled work rolls, there's a large backup roll which lends strength and pressure to the operation. All the time, the slab is getting thinner and longer. Both here and in the finishing stands, jets of high-pressure water are directed onto the surface of the metal to clear it of any remaining scale. It's very important that all the scale is cleaned off before the hot metal enters the finishing stands. Otherwise, it will penetrate the surface of the finished material and affect both the final properties and the surface finish of the stripped steel. When the material has been rolled from its initial nine inches down to anything between two inches and one-tenth of an inch thick, it's known as plate. Plate can be up to 12 feet wide. From the roughing mill, it's on to the finishing mill, where the thickness is further reduced and the length correspondingly increased. In order to meet the high standards of flatness required across the width of the sheet steel, all six stands in the finishing train are four high. These large backup rolls are needed to limit the bowing of the smaller work rolls under the heavy working strain. Because the strip is continuous, and it's usually in all the stands at once, the entry speed of a particular set of rolls must exactly match the speed of the steel as it reaches it. 
If it doesn't, the tension of the strip metal between the stands can lead to unacceptable variations in the thickness and the width of the finished steel. It can occasionally lead to breakage of the strip. So getting the tension right between the mill stands is critically important. From the finishing stands, the strip emerges at a roaring 40 miles an hour down a long run-out table over which multiple water jets are playing. The temperature of the strip has to be nearly halved from its 1100 degrees centigrade before it can be coiled. In its lighter gauges, the strip steel would present insuperable handling problems unless it could be coiled as continuously as it arrives. After coiling and cooling, it can be dispatched, but it's still quite soft. If the steel is going to be used to press parts for cars, for example, it'll need to be toughened and have its surface made hard. Cold reduction, or cold rolling as it's known, will achieve this effect and incidentally make the sheet even thinner. Before this can be done, any surface scale and rust which has accumulated while the steel has been stored will have to be removed. This is done by a process known as pickling. Again, it's a continuous operation. The strip is uncoiled, and to avoid having to thread each coil separately through the line, the end of one coil is welded onto the front of the next. The strip is then passed through a series of hydrochloric acid baths. After the acid, it's washed in water tanks and finally passed through hot air dryers. The strip is then coated with oil to protect it before being rewound into coils. The bright, clean coils, protected against corrosion, go next to the coal rolling mill where they're reduced to the required thickness. Typical is this five-stand mill, which passes the coil through a series of rolls in tandem. Each set of rolls is mounted in a four-high configuration. In cold rolling, the squeezing action of the rolls not only thins the sheet, but also alters its structure. It imposes on the strip an elongated grain structure aligned in the direction of rolling. Because no heat is involved, recrystallization and grain growth don't take place. The reduction in thickness is helped by maintaining the tension in the strip between each of the stands in the mill. In this way, the thickness of the material can be reduced to a few thousandths of an inch. One disadvantage is that the strip steel does become work hardened by this method of cold rolling. Some cold rolled steels tend to crack if they're used straight away. This can be prevented by annealing. The coils are heated in an inert gas atmosphere. The absence of oxygen prevents scale appearing. The coils are kept at 700 degrees centigrade for 72 hours and then allowed to cool slowly in their protective blanket of inert gas. To meet their final specification, the coils are subjected to temper rolling. They're passed cold through a single stand four high temper mill, where a small reduction in thickness, not more than 4%, takes place. This operation also removes any residual undulations and induces a controlled amount of hardness or temper into the surface skin of the cold rolled strip, which has become soft after the annealing process. Cold rolling is ideal where the material isn't thick enough to retain its heat and where a first-class surface finish and exceptional dimensional accuracy is demanded. Hot rolling is reserved for the breaking down of large steel ingots into sections, plate, strip and bar of various shapes and sizes. Some of these techniques date from the 17th century. 
though they haven't changed much since Edwardian times. Others are new, exciting, and offer tremendous opportunities for the future.